Hi ladies. This week we're studying in the book of Matthew again and we are going over chapters 19 and 20. And so in the book of Matthew we talked about how we feel a rhythm um, we'll have blocks of narrative or a narrator that's telling us a story and then we'll have blocks that are discourse where it's Jesus actually teaching on um, a spiritual matter with the authority that Jesus has to teach on that and so you feel that rhythm back and forth through the entire book of Matthew in the chapters we're working on today in 19 and 20 you're gonna feel uh, we're in a discourse chapter so you're gonna have a lot of teaching from Jesus on the topics that that we're gonna cover and that you'll um, discover as you're reading those chapters so again I would say um, sit down with your Bible and try to read the entire chapter of 19 through first just read it all in one sitting if that's possible um, for you and then go back and work through the sections and I just divided it up I use an ESV study Bible and I just divided it up and put titles on my page that were the titles that were in my Bible and so that's the divisions the chunks of verses and so like the first portion that after you read the entire book of chap or not the entire book, the entire chapter of 19, then go back and read verses 1 through 12 again and think about just that section. Um, I broke it down in verses, so you're going to look at the very first verse 3, and um, the Pharisees are asking Jesus questions, and this is on the topic of divorce, and so... Um, explore just a little bit what were the Pharisees what was their motivation were they really asking him questions to gain knowledge from him or did they have another objective or motivation for their questions um, Jesus as he always does answers their question and when he does that I want you to think about who does Jesus point to or reference with the answer he gives? And in parentheses, after that question, I did just put a little reference, a little cross-reference, I guess it's called, back to Genesis 2, 24. And that's going to give you just a little bit more um, solidity to that answer of who he's referencing. Because he doesn't flat out say it, it's more draws your mind to it. You'll understand it as you read it and as you go there. Then we move on and Jesus, um, the Pharisees again ask him another question moving along, wanting what they're trying to do is their motive is kind of to incriminate him, have him incriminate himself, to contradict himself, to to not be true. He's too good to be true and so they're trying to get him to mess up. And then you have verse 8 and 9 where Jesus once again responds to them. I have personally always like kind of felt it was a little muddly or in my mind, not the scripture. In my mind, I can't, I couldn't get clarity on verse 8. Something that um, came to me this time is I read in the bottom of my Bible, like I said, I used the ESV study Bible. And in the bottom pages of my Bible, I have some notes, some commentary in there. And so I looked at chapter 19, verse 8, and what I did in the notes for you is I copied that whole section talking about verse 8 of chapter 19, and it talks about hardness of heart, and it just talks about divorce and marriage, and it, and it talks about that a lot and gives some clarity on that. And so when I got done with that, um, I just felt like I understood that in a way I hadn't before. It made sense to me um, about the whole sinful world that we live in and how all of the things, um, all of our shortcomings, all of the things are because we're not in that perfect world that he created us in because of sin. And so just wander through there. I put my very, very personal thoughts on there Ask God to reveal to you what he's saying to you. So I just want, to, I want you to know this is my thoughts in this section 
Um, and then just after that, I just paused. I just stopped and I paused and I took a moment just to thank God for Jesus and for the Redeemer that he is to us and to thank him for Jesus' shed blood that covers all of our sins. It's not exclusive. It covers all of our sins. And so I just found a really sweet moment of visiting and thanking Jesus for that precious, precious gift. And then moved on to verse 10 and 12. And here we have the disciples. Now they've listened to this whole conversation, this whole teaching that Jesus has done with the Pharisees. And now they're like panicking, freaking out, overreacting just a little bit. And they start to question, oh, maybe it's not even right to get married. Maybe it's better to be single. And so then you have that whole discussion back and forth. And Jesus addresses all of that, brings a solid answer to all of that. Um, I would just say to me, what I got out of that was our relationships ultimately should serve as a reflection on our relationship with God. They should always reflect, just like Jesus always reflected his Father, we should always reflect God, or that should be what we strive to do. Moved on then to verse 13 through 15, talks about Jesus welcoming the children, blessing the children, and um, some parallels there that we see. Verse 16 through 29 talks about the rich young man. This might be a familiar passage to you, so just had a couple questions that I wrote down there for you to ponder and to think on um, and some of the interaction that the disciples had with watching that young man um, visit with Jesus and how they viewed that and then Jesus being able to minister to the disciples and explain um, to them about um, what they were seeing and what it really, what he really desired from them. Um, and that kind of closes chapter, that's what you kind of close chapter 19 with. For me, I had such a personal reflection, uh, or uh, I guess chapter 19, what it really spoke to me. It just reminded me again that the critical piece in all of this is our heart posture. Rules have value, but keeping them does not secure my standing with God if I'm keeping them just to keep the rules. Additionally, possessions, wealth, do not equate to favor with God. What God longs for is he wants my hands to be open, not depending on anything other than him, not holding on too tightly to anything he's given me or anything other than him, but to have those open hands to share that, to give that, to be able to release that blessing if, if suddenly it's gone, to have that open hands and then that undivided heart. That my heart, he is the master of my heart, not the things he's given me, not the things I have, but that my heart is undivided my open hands and my undivided heart. And so that is what came to me from chapter 19. Then moving on to chapter 20, I say read the whole chapter as a whole again, read chapter 20, and then as you have you know time and opportunity, come back and break it apart in the sections. And again, I have it just broken down the way it did in my Bible. Verse 1 through 16, you're going to read about laborers in a vineyard. And... Um, you're going to, Jesus uses a simile or a comparison comparing the kingdom of heaven to the vineyard owner and how that owner pays and rewards his employees for their day's work. Um, I want you to pause and think about, do you see that vineyard owner as a just person or an unjust person? After you get to your answer there, think personally because I think it's always important to think of okay in that setting in that time when this took place how does it affect the people there but then we know that the scripture is for us too so how does this have relevance to me what can I get out of that so the next question I, I would have you consider is do you do I ever struggle with God's generosity toward other people 
then after you spend some time with that question, you're going to move on to verse 17 to 19. And Jesus is going to foretell a little bit more about his death. This will be like the third time, I think, that he's talked about his death. This time he's going to name a few names. He's going to give us a few more details. He's giving them to the disciples. He's going to tell a little bit about who's doing it. Um, and so that section gives us just a little bit more insight into what is just around the corner, what is going to be coming up. Then you have verses 20 through 28, a mother's request is the title there. And so a mom, the, the mom of the sons of Zebedee, who are James and John, um, that mother came to Jesus and she had a special request for her sons. Well, the disciples, the other disciples were hearing all of this take place and they became indignant. They were annoyed. So why were they annoyed? Explore that just a little bit. What what was irritating to them about that whole conversation and that whole request? <coughs> I'm sorry. The thing I would have you think on, the thing that I had to think on, the question I posed to you after you after seeing that they were indignant, did the other disciples feel that the request was not appropriate? Is that what upset them? Or did each of the disciples feel that they should have what the mother requested for her two sons? Again, it's a reflection and it's a, you know, just looking at your own heart and your own motives and making sure that that, that heart is not divided, that that heart is not being selfish. And so Jesus, once again, he answers them he shares with them. He talks about that recurring theme that we hear so often that the um, that the last will be first, and that the person, you know, the servant is going to be lifted up. And so he talks about that a little bit. And it just reminded me back in the very beginning when we started the book of Matthew. I think it was Mari that talked about. She used the term an upside down kingdom. And so we're seeing that being talked about just a little bit more here where they were used to a king and then people falling down in the order going to the least of them, the servants, the slaves. This is flipping it around and saying, you know what, King Jesus is here and he is serving you and he is lifting those servants and those slaves and those less desirable people up and he's getting rid of that whole class and hierarchy. Um, business and so it's turning their traditional thinking and kingdom upside down the chapter closes then with jesus um, healing two blind men he was walking he had crowds with him he hears in the crowds he's walking to the most um, trying days of his life here on earth they were upon him they were just around the corner and he knew that was coming and so as a as a human being when I have things that are really, really a big deal and really tense and really heavy emotionally and physically and um, mentally on me, I don't always hear the requests around me and I don't react tenderly. But yet he was walking toward what would become his ending days um, and the crucifixion ultimately. And yet he hears these men calling over and over to him um, asking for healing. And Jesus beautifully and tenderly stops, asks them what they desire, puts his hand on their eyes and heals them. <sighs> what a great example. It caused me to pause to think about he always keeps what's important important. And he was on the way to his death and yet he stopped to heal these two men. Um, so that just that part really was convicting and touched me a lot and that's how the chapter ends up and So just work through that again. This is set up so you can take chunks at a time You don't have to sit down and do the whole thing before you even begin your study though take just a moment Excuse me, take just a moment and ask God to speak to you to open your heart to what he'd have you hear from him in that so I'm gonna to close today. I don't wanna take any more time except for I'm gonna just pray over you because I miss you and I miss praying with you. And so if you just bow with me, we'll just pray for a minute and then we um, will be finished. So 
Dear God, I just come to you. I lift up these women that I'm used to fellowshipping with or um, I lift them up to you, God. I praise you for each one of them and the things you're doing in their life, the things you have planned and set forth um, for them to accomplish. Lord, I pray that you will be mighty in strength for them, that you will groom them and get them ready for exactly um, what you're preparing them for, that you'll give them strength, that you'll encourage them, that, that you'll give them insight as they seek you, that you will bless them for spending time um, getting to know you better through the scripture. And Father, I just ask that you will be very near to them. You know each one of our individual needs, and I lift them up to you at this time. Father, I pray for strength. I pray for protection. I pray that you will keep each of these women strong mentally, physically, emotionally, that you will draw them close to yourself, Father, and that they will feel your love, that they will feel the power of your love and the strength and encouragement that you provide to us. So, Father, I give you this study. I ask that you bless it um, as the women travel through it and work through it. I pray also that you would bless each one of them. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are a good God who loves us, a God who works, who has promised to work all things together for good for those who love him. We praise you for that. And so, God, we can say thank you before we even know how you're going to move and work on our behalf. So we say thank you, Father, and we look with expectant eyes for the things you're going to do and the ways you're going to move on these prayers that we bring before you in faith. Father, I ask again your blessing on each one of these women, that you guide them, that you protect them, and that you would just um, shine your light on them and your light through them. And I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, ladies, make it a great day. God bless.